welcome to PWO English YouTube channel. I'm Shani Somshekar, your botany teacher. And in today's lecture, we are going to be summarizing the chapter Organisms and Populations in one shot. This is the first chapter in the unit Ecology. Since this chapter is in the unit Ecology, let's begin today's session by trying to understand what exactly Ecology deals with, right? So, what is Ecology? Ecology is a branch of science like we all know. And ecology deals with the interactions between living organisms. It could be the interaction between living organisms belonging to the same species, living organisms belonging to two different species and also includes the interactions between living organisms and its surrounding environment which includes a lot of abiotic factors. How a living organism interacts with water around it, with the air and uh, with the soil, all of that is what we will study under ecology. Now let's talk about the levels of biological organization. So when you consider um, any, for example, um, you have a city, a city is in a state, a state is, in a, is part of a country and a country is a part of a continent, like that you have different levels of organization, right? Very similarly, when you consider a living organism like us, even in us, we see different levels of organization where the most basic level is the macromolecular level. Like you already know, you've learned it in 11th grade, that living organisms, uh, in every one of our living cells, we, we have macromolecules like proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and uh, what else? Proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids present. So, they make up our cells. Similar types of cells come together and form tissues. Tissues, different types of tissues come together and form an organ. Different organs work in a coordinated way to perform one physiological function and form an organ system. Many organ systems will result in organisms like us, right? So, these are some levels of organization that you're already aware of. Now, in ecology, we'll take it one notch higher. So, individual organisms up until then, we are aware. What is the next level? The next level is the population level. Generally, when we hear the term population, we tend to associate it with population explosion that's taking place in India, how the number of individuals are increasing at an exponential rate, right? But in ecology, when we talk about population, we're not talking about how the number of humans are increasing, how the number of any other species of animal is increasing. Over here, population basically is a level in biological organization. How can we define population? Population can be defined as a group of individuals belonging to the same species, occupying a particular geographical area at a particular time can be defined as a population. What definition the population has here is very different from the definition of population you might have in your head. Over here, when we talk about population in ecology, we say it's a group of individual belonging to the same species, occupying the same area at a particular time. So that is a population. So whenever we talk about populations in ecology, we associate that with a particular geographical area. It could be a room, it could be a house, it could be a street, it could be a forest, it could be anything. But when we discuss population, we talk about it with respect to an area. All right. So population usually, not usually, all the time is of one species. A human population in this house, a population of mosquitoes in this room, a population of ants in your basement. So, these are populations. When we talk about populations, you're talking about one specific species, all right? Now, next level is communities. Communities is basically when in a geographical area, you have more than one species. Right now, in this room that I'm teaching from, there are mosquitoes. I did spot two mosquitoes and um, I'm there. I'm a human. Uh, so, you have two different species, right? So, that is a community. Or if you take your house or your street for that matter, there will be a population of some rose plants, there will be a population of crows, there will be a population of humans, there will be a population of dogs. So, these are different populations. All of them coming together in one area, that is your biological community. So, the next level is our ecosystem level. What is ecosystem level? Remember, I told you in ecology, we're going to study about how living organisms interact with the abiotic environment as well. Up until this point, we've only been talking about living organisms. In ecosystem level, we bring in the abiotic factors as well. So, in an ecosystem, we are talking about communities where there are different species, 
present along with its abiotic environment that is our ecosystem next level is the biome biomes are usually these uh, geographical areas huge biogeographical areas that are characterized by their own set of abiotic conditions as well as their own set of living organisms for example we say desert is a biome we say that um, rainforest is a biome we say um, tundra regions that is a biome so what is a desert how do we know that a land is a desert we know that it's a desert because it has its own set of abiotic factors there's very little water present there the temperature is very high there's very uh, scarce rainfall so we know those are the abiotic things similarly whenever we think about deserts and the animals in the deserts or the plant in the desert we think about camels we think about kangaroo rats we think about cactus plants so an area a biogeographical area we say which is uh, in which characteristic abiotic conditions are present along with characteristic organisms that have adapted to that area and have successfully thrived in that area okay so those are biomes all the biomes in the world put together will give us our biosphere okay so these are the different levels of um, biological organization now in ecology what do we study about our studies start with organisms individual organisms organisms populations communities ecosystems biomes all of this will be covered in our ecological studies all right though ncrt mentions only organisms populations communities and biomes everything from this point up until this point is going to be covered in ecological studies so up until the previous year in ncrt in this particular chapter we used to discuss about organisms in the first half and populations in the second half of the chapter that is why the chapter is called organisms and populations but this year because the syllabus has gotten rationalized a major chunk of this chapter has been deleted so the organisms part is completely deleted and all we're left with is the population chunk the second half okay so it's still called organisms and population but we're not going to be discussing anything related to organisms our focus will be on populations all right now let's move on and talk about what populations are it's very clear in nature whenever you look at any uh, organism it's very rare that it's living its life isolated without interacting with other organisms of the same species generally if you see most organisms they live in groups they live in groups in well defined geographical areas within that area they are sharing for similar resources such as uh what can we say food for mate for space to live in and they potentially interbreed they are capable of interbreeding this interbreeding usually means sexual reproduction but asexually reproduce whatever offspring we get that is also considered as a part of the same population so when we define population we say it is a group of organisms belonging to the same species in a well defined geographical area Uh, at any particular time so that is a population what are some examples of populations i already gave you a couple of examples but let's take a look at what are the examples that we have in ncrt all of the cormorants present in a wetland what are these cormorants they are a type of birds so in a wetland they usually found in wetlands uh, so all of the cormorants that are present in a wetland is one population remember i told you whenever we are talking about population we are going to talk about it with respect to a a particular place right a particular geographical area so rats in an abandoned dwelling so some house is abandoned and the rats present there so you can make up your own population stick wood trees present in a forest tract bacteria that are present in a culture plate lotus plants that are present in a pond all of these are examples of different populations here you have examples of animal populations plant populations microbial populations all of that this is just for you to get a brief idea about what population is all right now let's move on yeah so what is population ecology um you know you've learned about evolution right in zoology you've learned about evolution and you know how living organisms evolve as and when the surrounding conditions change they adapt and over a course of time they evolve right so whenever there is a change in the surrounding conditions right when uh, let's say there is a there are 10 organisms of one species 10 individual organisms of one species in a particular geographical area and they've been adapted to a particular type of environmental condition now suddenly in that area the temperature will drop drop very low 
Now, that is a change in the surrounding environment. According to this, these organisms will start adapting. Individual organisms will start adapting. Despite individual organisms starting to adapt, when we say evolution has occurred, they have adapted and they have evolved and these are the adaptations that they've come up with. When we talk about adaptations, adaptations happen at a population level. So what they're trying to say in this particular statement in NCRT is, although an individual organism is the one Every individual organism has to cope with the changing environment. If evolution has to take place, evolution happens at the population level and not at the individual level. In that case, population ecology, what we're dealing with, will form like a bridge between ecology and population. Wait. It will link ecology to population genetics as well as evolution. All right, now let's move on. Huh. Let's talk about some attributes that populations have. A population has a certain attributes that us individual organisms do not have. For example, when you consider us humans or any organism for that matter, there is birth and there is death, right? So we have births and we have deaths. But if you consider a population, there is a birth rate and a death rate. Birth rates and death rates are attributes that a population has which I cannot have. I either have birth or death, right? But in population, you have birth rates and death rates. So what exactly are these birth rates and death rates? Whenever we are talking about rates, we are looking at time also, right? You may have learned about it in physics and mathematics as well. So rates, when we're talking uh, about rates, we're talking about change in something with respect to time. So birth rate and death rate are the same thing. I will explain it to you very simply by using two very easily understandable examples that you have in NCRT. Firstly, if we have to understand birth rate, let's consider a pond. In a pond, there are lotus plants growing. There are 20 lotus plants initially. After a year, because of sexual reproduction, Eight new plants have been added to the same pond. Now, what is the area that we are considering? We are considering a pond. What is the organism we are considering? We are considering the lotus plant. What is the time duration we are considering? We are considering one year. So, initially there were 20 plants. After a year, there are 28 plants. So, eight plants have been newly added to the population. Though it is not like giving birth, you can think of it as birth. Okay, so new plants are added to the population. So, the current population will be 28. Now, what, how would you calculate the birth rate? The birth rate can be calculated by having how many new plants are added, how many new organisms are added over the numerator and in the denominator, you will have the initial population size. Initially, there were 20. So, 8 divided by 20 is going to give us 0 0.4. 0 0.4 of spring, remember, always you have to say per year, per lotus. Birth rate is per capita. You may have studied about per capita income in social science, right? So, it's very similar to that. In birth rate, we are talking about per capita increase in population size because of birth. So, here 0.4 offspring per lotus per year. Every time you have to mention, mention the time duration as well. Now, death rate. If you have understood birth rate, death rate is very simple to understand. Uh, here you have a uh, Fruit flies, for example, here, here they've given a plant example, here you have an animal example. So, there were 40 fruit flies in a lab, 4 of them died over the course of 1 week. Initially, there were 40, then 4 died. So, what do you do to calculate the death rate? How many died? You have that over the numerator and then in the denominator, you have the initial uh, size of the population, which is 40. So, what you get as a result will give you the death rate and how do you write it? 0 0.1 individuals per capita. So, per fruit fly per week. That's how you write it. Based on this, you may be asked questions in your competitive exams. Now, another population attribute that we have to talk about which individuals will not have but populations will have is the sex ratio. As an individual, you could be a male or a female. But a sex ratio is seen only in a population where there are many individuals, right? So, 
For example, 60% females and 40% males. This is a sex ratio. So if one individual person is there, you don't have a sex ratio. For a ratio to be there, there should be more than one people, person, right? So in a population, since there's more than one organisms, you have an attribute called sex ratio, which you will not have in an individual organism. So that's another population attribute. Now, there's something called age pyramids that we have to learn about. What are these age pyramids? You consider any population of any organism. It could be a plant, it could be an animal, any population. Let's consider a human population. The humans that are present in your house, let's say, that is the population. Even within your house, you have individuals belonging to different age groups, right? Like I am in my 30s. In my house, if I consider, I am in my 30s and my son is still a toddler. He is 5 years old and I have parents-in-law who are in their 60s and 70s. So, within my own house, if I consider this household as one population of humans, there are organisms belonging to, I mean, organisms in different age groups. Not just in my house, if you consider any population anywhere, you will have organisms that are present in different age groups, right? So, whenever you plot the percentage of individuals of a particular age, what we get as a result is called an age pyramid. You know what pyramids are, right? In Egypt, you have these pyramids that are triangular shaped. That is what the age pyramid is all about. So why are we calling it the age pyramid? What are we using to plot this pyramid? We are using the percentage of individuals in a particular age group to plot this. That's why we are calling it the age pyramid. For example, if you consider a group of 100 people, among these 100 people, about um, 20 people could be over 60 years of age. There could be 40 people that are between 20 to 59 years of age. And there could be, how many are left? 40, 60, 70, wait, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 40 more. I'm sorry, my math is not very sharp. <laughs> so 40 more, they are under 20. Okay, so these percentages, you if you plot it, what you get as a result is what we call a um, age pyramid. Okay, so here are some examples. Yeah, here is one example to show you. This is an age pyramid of a human population. Whenever we plot age pyramids of human populations, usually within the same pyramid, we will also show the age distribution of males and females. For example, over here, if you see, here female is written, here male is written. I'm not sure if it's very clear for you. Here female is there, here male is there. So here, what you're shown in the center is the age. This is a baby, zero. I mean, not even one year old. Here you have 20 years, here you have 40 years. How wide this is determines how many individuals are present in that group. Okay, so if these individuals are more in number, then that will be very wide. The width will be more. If there are fewer young individuals, this will be narrow. If there are more individuals present in 40, 20 age, their, uh, these bands will be wider here. Okay, so that is what we see in age pyramids. Just because we call it pyramids, it is not necessary that these age pyramids are always triangular in nature, depending upon the um, percentage of individuals present in different groups, you can have different shapes for your age pyramids. Okay, R regardless, we call it age pyramids only. Now, what you're looking at here is generally how age pyramids are plotted. So, the percentage of individuals present in different age groups, I said, how do we differentiate what age group, uh, how to group these different individuals? What we do is we um, group them depending upon their reproductive ability. Now, if you consider humans, humans immediately after they are born, they are not capable of reproduction. It will take a couple of years to gain the ability to reproduce. So, as long as they are not able to reproduce, we can call that the pre-reproductive age group. As and when reproductive ability is gained, we can call that the reproductive period. Once the reproductive ability is lost or declined, you can say that it is the post-reproductive period. Okay, so we can say pre-reproductive age group, reproductive age group, post-reproductive age group. By convention, pre-reproductive age group is always going to be towards the base, for reproductive towards the center and post-reproductive higher up. Okay, now depending upon the shape of these pyramids, we can kind of uh, 
you know get to know about this growth status of that particular population all right so here you have three different types what you're looking at here is a triangular age pyramid what you're looking at here is a bell shaped age pyramid and finally here we have an urn shaped age pyramid so in the triangular age pyramid the bottom most bar is going to be the widest that's why it's appearing like a triangle what does this indicate pre-reproductive individuals are the highest in number that means they have not yet gained their reproductive ability very soon they're going to gain the reproductive ability they're going to start reproducing make babies and as a result the population is going to expand grow much larger than it currently is next we have stable if the um, age pyramid is bell shaped then the reproductive and pre-reproductive reproductive i'm sorry pre-reproductive represented by yellow bar and uh, reproductive represented by blue bar you can see that there's not much difference like you see here it is pretty much the same so what does that indicate once these guys lose the reproductive ability they will become post-reproductive and these pre-reproductive individuals will replace this since there's not much difference between these two the population size is not going to change very dramatically it's going to pretty much remain the same so it's going to be stable so we can say that this is a stable uh, i mean this kind of age pyramid indicates that the population uh, growth is going to be or the growth status is stable what would happen if the pre-reproductive individuals are the least in number there's not enough individuals to replace these guys so as a result the population is going to decline over time that is how we get to know about the growth status of a population i hope this is clear now let's talk about the size of a population when we talk about size we usually think of it in terms of the number of individuals present in a population right the size of the population also indicates its status in the habitat now there are so many ecological processes such as outcome of competition with another species impact of a predator on a uh, population if they've sprayed some pesticide then the effect of it on the population all of that can be evaluated in terms of change in the population size this was the number of uh, what was that pesticide okay so this was the number of pests that were there in a crop field before the application of the pesticide now that we've applied the pesticide how do we know whether it's worked or not how do you evaluate that you can evaluate that by counting the number of it again so if you know the number or if you know the population size it's possible to evaluate a lot of ecological processes right now like i mentioned whenever we talk about size we generally think about it in terms of numbers especially population size now the population size can vary widely right it can be as small as one bird or uh, i'm sorry population has to be greater than one it can be as little as less than 10 individuals in a uh, population for example you know siberian cranes they are from siberia clearly but they migrate and come to some parts of india at any time if you go to the bharatpur wetlands you can see about less than 10 cranes there if you count the number of chlamydomonas in a pond chlamydomonas is a blue green alga unicellular very small organism and hundreds and thousands and probably lakhs of it could be present in one single pond so it could go into millions as well so the size is highly variable in nature though we generally um, you know talk about numbers when we mention population size at some times if you have to uh, find out the population size of a population obviously it might be very difficult to count every individual if the number of individuals is very high or it could be meaningless sometimes to um, you know count the number of organisms in a population so what do we do then yeah population can uh, population size technically we call that population density and it's represented as capital letter n okay like i already mentioned it need not necessarily be measured in numbers mostly it is measured in numbers but sometimes measuring numbers could be meaningless or it could be very difficult in such cases what do we do what else can be done what could be done is you can measure the percentage cover or biomass here is an example there is an area in this area there is one large banyan tree 
okay one large banyan tree is present one its number is one in the same area within the same area you have about 200 carrot grass plants carrot grass plant is your parthenium plant now if in this case we are trying to measure the number for population density it would be like we are underestimating the banyan tree banyan tree has huge contributions to make to that particular ecosystem but just by saying that there's only one of it and 200 of carrot grasses we are kind of undermining its the role that it's playing in that ecosystem so in such cases what could be done we can measure the biomass that the um, banyan tree has or you can measure the percentage cover how much area it's covering because it'll have a huge canopy right so this is one of the uh, ways in which you can measure the population density like i already mentioned sometimes if the numbers are huge you can't really sit down and count every organism right that becomes very meaningless what do you do in such cases instead of looking at the absolute densities instead of sitting and counting every one of them you can measure the relative densities what are relative densities for example if you want to count the number of fishes in a pond instead of counting every fish there is in the pond you catch some fishes see in that trap how many you've got how many fishes you could catch in the trap will give you a rough idea about how many fishes there might be present in the pond right so that is a relative density so instead of measuring absolute densities you measure your relative density that will give us a, a rough idea another type is indirect estimation which is what they employ when they count when they do this tiger census and all of that because um, you can't always go near a tiger and count and all of that right so what they do indirectly to measure uh, the number of tigers is it's pug marks pug marks apparently are unique to every tiger and it changes with age and all of that so uh, they will check the pug marks and also fecal pellets so the excreta of uh, these tigers are collected and they are uh, they do some DNA tests on it and find out how many tigers are present in an area. So these are the different uh, methods that you could employ to measure population density instead of numbers alone. All right. Now, let's talk about population growth. Population growth, right? So population size will not remain constant all the time. If in a street there were three dogs the three dogs are not going to remain three dogs for life right one dog could die another dog from another street could come to this street one of the dogs from this street could go to another street one dog in the same street could give birth and add three more puppies or dogs to the same street so a lot of things will result in change in population over a course of time the size of the population could increase or it could decrease but what I'm trying to say here is that the size of a population is not a static thing. It's going to change over time, right? So what does it depend on? It depends on a lot of things like the availability of food. Are they facing any predation pressures? Is the weather very adverse? So it, depending, upon, depending upon all of these, the uh, population size will change. But there are four very important processes, four basic processes that will result in change in population size and cause the population density to fluctuate. So what are these things? It is natality, mortality, immigration, emigration. Whatever I just told you about dogs is the exact same thing, but we're giving it fancy names, all right? So what is natality? Natality is the number of births during a given period in the population. So when some organism is giving birth, it is adding to the population. Mortality is death. If a couple of organisms in a population are dying, that will decrease the population density. Immigration. From some other population, an organism enters this population that is adding to the population density. Emigration. Some organisms from a particular population have left that population and that will cause a decrease in the population density. So these are the four processes that will alter and cause the population density to fluctuate. Now, Here's an NCRT uh, kind of flow chart that you have that you need to understand. Let's say there is this is population density. It's represented by N, like I already said. 
there are two processes that will increase the population density so you have plus and plus here which are those birth natality somebody being born in the same population immigration from some other population an organism enters here both of them will add to the number of organisms that are already present there and there are two processes that will reduce the population density which are deaths which is mortality and emigration people from this population leaving and going to some other populations okay so how do you represent this with an equation very simple if you consider nt to be the population density at time t over a period of time one year one month whatever time at time t plus one after some time how do you represent it nt plus b plus i birth plus immigration minus death plus emigration the greater number of deaths compared to birth and immigration population density is going to decrease if the birth and immigration sum is greater than death and emigration sum then the population density is going to increase it all depends on these four basic processes now let's talk about something called growth models what are these growth models now we know that a population with time the size is going to change is there any predictable pattern that the population growth follows do you think there is yes there is there are two different patterns that any population follows could follow they are exponential growth and logistic growth what exactly are these let's find out first let's talk about exponential growth you know what exponential means right you've learned in your uh, first uh, 11th grade in plant growth and development how um, exponential growth happens geometric growth arithmetic growth rate and all of that in plant growth and development what you're going to learn here is very similar to that okay so what happens here change in population density is dn by dt okay so we are trying to find out what is the pattern that a population follows over here we plotted a graph where you have time on the x axis and the population density on the y axis at time 0 you have some population right some number of individuals are present there over the course of time it's increasing exponentially that is why it's called exponential growth in exponential growth you get a j shaped curve as you can see here and if you were to represent it in the form of an equation here's what it's going to be like dn by dt is equal to n what is n n is the population density multiplied with birth rate minus death rate b stands for birth rate minus d stands for death rate within that population over that time b minus d birth rate minus death rate into n will give us the equation b minus d can be represented as r now what is r r is very very important r stands for intrinsic rate of natural increase so what is r here r will determine the status of the population if the births are greater than the deaths the r value is going to be high higher the r value higher the r value more rapid is the growth of the population for example in ncrt a couple of examples are given for norway rat r is 0.015 indian human population in the year 1981 r was 0.0205 flower beetle r value is 0.12 so what this basically indicates is the rate at which this population is going to increase in size is greater than this which is in turn greater than this so higher the r value much sooner is the population going to increase in size it's going to increase in size at a very rapid rate right so if you uh, you know integrate it you get this formula nt is equal to n not e to the power rt you've studied something very similar to this in uh, plant growth and development w not is equal to uh, wt is equal to w not e to the power rt right where you learned about um, geometric growth you had learned about this equation it's very similar now when can this happen when does population growth happen like this when does population density increase like this whenever 
in a population in the surrounding area the resources are unlimited if a population has to grow it has to be supplied with food all the time there should be sufficient space for all the organisms that are living there if the population size has to be sustained and increase constantly then there should not be any uh, predation pressure no other pressure evolution uh, i'm sorry uh, pressure should be there for the population under such ideal conditions where everything is favorable the population will show this kind of growth which is called the exponential growth but in nature does it ever happen that exponential growth can happen forever no it doesn't exponential growth cannot happen forever because at one point or the other one of the um, resources will start to become limiting for example 100 uh, one one organism i'm sorry two organisms became four four became eight like that it, it went on increasing exponentially but eventually the food will start becoming limiting because the number of organisms are too much now the food will start getting uh, what do we say the available food will start declining or there will not be sufficient space for everybody or there will not be sufficient mates for everybody to reproduce at the same rate or there could be more predation pressure so one of these things will happen as a result this kind of j shaped curve cannot keep going that way forever what will happen instead under normal conditions where everything is limited the resources are limited we have another type of growth curve which we will talk about okay so here what do we uh, mean by this equation uh, what are the different uh, uh, yeah so let's understand this equation n not is population density at time 0 nd is population density at time t r is i already told you it's b minus d birth rate minus death rate remember it's birth rate minus death rate not births minus death okay so it is the intrinsic rate of natural increase e you know e is the base of natural logarithms which is 2.17 wait 71828 all right so and whenever conditions are favor uh, not fa wait whenever resources are limiting i said there is another kind of um, growth that happens that is the logistic growth this is also called verhulst per logistic growth like i already mentioned the condition here is limited resources here you can see an s shaped curve which is called a sigmoid curve in a sigmoid curve you can typically three see three phases initially there is a slow growth it is called the lag phase then you have exponential growth which is called the log phase ultimately you have the steady phase what basically happens here is there is something called carrying capacity if you consider any population living in a particular area that area will only have the ability to support a particular number of individuals for example let's consider um a forest in a forest there are a couple of trees present but if the number of trees keep on increasing that that particular stretch of forest can accommodate let's say 200 trees if the number becomes more than that the area will not be able to accommodate more number of individuals why because the soil will not be able to supply sufficient nutrients to the plants or that plants will not be able to get sufficient sunlight for one reason or the other in an area where the resources are limited only a particular number of individuals can be supported for example in my house for whatever salary i draw i can support only a set number of individuals i cannot support 100 people coming and staying in my house right so i have a limitation like that even biogeographical areas will have limitations with respect to the resources there are food could be limiting space could be limiting sunlight could be limiting there are so many different factors so given all the conditions an area can support only a set number of individuals in a population a fixed number of individuals in a population so that is called the carrying capacity how many organisms of a particular species how many organisms in a particular population can that area carry how much can it nourish how much can it support that is the carrying capacity so up until it reaches the carrying capacity which we represent by k here there's going to be an 
exponential growth as it approaches the carrying capacity it's going to reduce the rate at which it is showing an increase so at that point it will slow down and finally an asymptote is reached we say you know what that is in math right when you have two lines very close to each other but they never meet at all that is an asymptote finally the population will not reach the carrying capacity will be a little less than that so in that case we will get an s-shaped curve which is called the sigmoid curve k here represents the carrying capacity it is the number of individuals of a population that a particular area can support can carry all right so how do we describe this equation here it is dn by dt is equal to rn very similar to how it was here right what is extra here carrying capacity because the resources are limiting limited in that the condition was resources were unlimited ideally here resources are limited how the case is in most um, environments so here because there are limited resources it can carry only a specific number of individuals so you have carrying capacity coming in here so this will be k minus n divided by k this will give us the equation everything else dn by dt is the rate r is the um, intrinsic uh, natural increase n is the population density k is the carrying capacity n again is the population density so it's the same thing here okay so in ncrt you have this diagram given where both the graphs are given together you can see how this is the carrying capacity as this blue color line reaches the carrying capacity it's going to slow down the rate of growth right now let's move on and talk about something called life history variation you know as biological organisms as living organisms we have a biological purpose right so you might have an aim to become a doctor you might aim to become a scientist you might aim to become a teacher whatever it is your purpose in life that is different as living organisms our bi biological purpose is to ensure that our species continues to live on earth and how is that brought about by reproduction so our biological purpose is to reproduce and ensure continuation of generation so over the course of time different organisms have come up with different ways and adapted in different ways according to the surroundings they lived in with respect to reproduction that is what we call life history variation so in a population organisms evolve to maximize their reproductive fitness in whichever habitat they live in under particular set of selection pressures organisms evolve towards the most effective reproductive strategy there are some organisms that reproduce only once in their entire lifetime there are some organisms that reproduce every year or more than once there are some organisms that will produce a large number of offspring that are small in size there are some organisms that will produce a large uh, fewer organisms that are larger in size so each of these is different the strategy is different but these organisms have evolved these reproductive strategies according to how their environment was what were the selection pressures that were operating at that time according to that they have evolved that is what we are going to be learning under life history variation like i mentioned some organisms breed only once in their entire lifetime examples for that include pacific salmon fish and bamboos some organisms breed many times during their lifetime includes us mammals and birds some produce a large number of small sized offspring they very small um, there is no parental care most of times so it is probable that the predators will feed on them so they will feed uh, they will produce a large number of offspring which out of which ultimately only a small will survive so um, oysters and fi uh, pelagic fishes some produce a small number of large sized offspring for example birds and mammals you see how there is parental care in birds and mammals right mammals uh we have um, mammary glands the females have mammary glands they nourish the baby they take care of the baby even in birds you can see how the parents will go get food and feed the bird so even though they are small they are taking care of them they are teaching them important life lessons and their survival rate is also great in that case you can see how a small number of organisms are produced that are relatively compared to this larger in size so this is life history variation now let's talk about the second part of this chapter called population interactions population interactions talks about how two different populations interact two different populations of two different species how they interact whenever two different populations of two different species are interacting 
the interaction in that interaction both of them could be benefited both of them could be harmed one of them could be benefited one of them could be harmed or one of them is benefited the other one is not affected at all one of them is harmed the other one is not affected at all so these kind of interactions we can see in nature this could be between plants and plants animals and animals plants and animals there are so many different way, uh, types all right so uh, they could be beneficial if it's beneficial we represent that with a plus mark if it is negative we represent that with a negative sign if it is neutral we represent that with a zero all right so these are the different types of population interactions that we can see in this chapter we are going to be learning about some of these population interactions for example we have mutualism in mutualism both the interacting species are benefited in competition both of them are harmed in predation one the predator gets the food benefited the prey is harmed positive negative parasitism parasite derives nutrition from the host parasite is benefited the host is harmed so positive negative commensalism one of the organisms is benefited for the other it is not neither a benefit nor harm so it is plus and zero amensalism is when one organism is harmed but the other one is neither benefited nor harmed so over here we are going to learn about all of these different types of interaction starting with predation i'm sure all of you know what predation is the moment we say predation i think some big cats come to your head either lion tiger leopard or something pouncing on a deer and feeding off of it right so why does predation happen in nature that is one of the ways in which energy transfer takes place from one gener uh, from one trophic level to another trophic level more about it you learn in the chapter ecosystem so whatever energy is fixed by plants the herbivores feed on it and get that energy right so though when we talk about predation we are thinking about animals eating animals whenever a sparrow is feeding on a seed whenever a cow is grazing on grass that also ecologically can be considered as predation because these animals are feeding on those plants that is also equivalent to predation with respect to ecology examples are tiger and deer but ecology ecologically sparrow eating a seed also is considered as a predator like i already mentioned these will act as conduits for energy transfer from one trophic level to another so yeah also what's important about predation is that predators because of feeding on these organisms they will keep the prey population in control okay now yeah why is predation ecologically so important without predators the prey population the prey species can reach very high population densities why is that bad that will cause you know imbalance in the ecosystem okay so uh at certain times what happens is whenever there is a particular organism that is not found in an area for example there is a plant in australia that you don't uh, there is a plant somewhere in america that you don't found it that you don't find in australia if by some chance this plant was introduced into australia where it was not originally found what happens is if it was in the place in its natural habitat which was america there would be some organisms that feed on it there could be some herbivorous plants i'm sorry herbivorous animals or there could be some uh, what do we say insects that feed on it natural predators will be there if you introduce that into an unknown new land where it was never present before those predators will not be present here as a result its numbers will go on increasing 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 it will start invading that piece of land you know what invasion is right invasion you learn about it in history where the mughal uh, some people came and they invaded in india we learn about all of those stories so similarly invasion here means from a different land it has come here and it has taken over completely so that can usually happen when that happens whatever plants were initially existing from uh, i mean uh, present in australia since the beginning those plant numbers will start coming down so whatever um, what do we say species were present there naturally from the start their numbers will start coming down because this new plant is invading the entire area one example for that we can see in the prickly pear cactus this is a very interesting story if you find the time you should go read about it 
uh, it was introduced into Australia in the 1920s. They apparently bought only two plants. That's how I remember reading it. So they got two plants and over a course of time, because they did not have any natural predators in Australia, it invaded millions of hectares of rangeland where proper agriculture used to take place. It invaded because it was very expensive for the farmers to get rid of these. They just left the land as it is and it caused the American government a lot, I'm sorry, the Australian government a lot to find a fix for this issue. So eventually what they did was they sent a team of scientists to America where this plant was naturally found and they captured some moths from there and got it to Australia and these moths ate up all these cacti and they it reduced its numbers. So here you can see how th these are the prickly pear cactus present in an agricultural land. They, it's just completely taken over the land. Here you can see after the, uh, it's the exact same uh, portion, it's the exact same area. So you can see after the moth was introduced here, how it has kind of eliminated all of the cacti from that region. The name of this moth is important to remember, it's called Cactoblastis cactorum, okay. So this is the importance of predation, if not for natural predators presence, the prey species will increase in number tremendously, it could cause a lot of harm to that particular ecosystem. Next, predator helps in maintaining species diversity. What do we understand when we say species diversity? Diversity means variety. Because predators are there, species diversity is also maintained. How do I tell this? I will explain with the help of an example. In American Pacific Coast, in the rocky intertidal communities, okay, intertidal communities, a starfish called Pisaster was present. This Pisaster basically feeds on invertebrates. Okay, so in an area, you have the starfish and you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 different types of invertebrates. 10 types, not 10 organisms, 10 different types. This would feed on all this. Because of the presence of this, here, this population diversity, 10 types of invertebrates were present. Experimentally, what they did was, they removed this out of this intertidal zone. What happened as a result was the competition between these invertebrates increased. As a result of increase in competition, many of them became extinct within just one year. Many were present. So many different types of invertebrates were present. This starfish was feeding on them. Once the starfish was experimentally removed from that area, because of an increase in the Indo-Pacific competition, many species went extinct to that extent it can affect whenever there is no predation okay next another thing to remember about predators are they are prudent in nature they are very calculative in nature they are not like us whenever you go to a buffet spread regardless of whether you are hungry or not you keep on eating 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 right they don't do that they don't hunt unless they are hungry because they know if they over hunt and if they over eat eventually the number of preys is going to come down and there will not be sufficient to, um, you know, support them. As a result, they are prudent. Now let's talk about what the prey species have evolved to reduce the impact of predation. Prey species know that predators will come in, you know, hunt them, feed on them, kill them and all of that. So over the course of evolution, they have also evolved some strategies to escape the predators. One very interesting uh, thing about these adaptations is the camouflage. You know what camouflage is, right? So there is a frog here. I'm not sure if you can see it. This frog, the texture, the color, everything looks very similar to the log of wood it is sitting on. Here, there is a leaf insect. This is the leaf insect that looks very similar to the leaf it is sitting on, including the vein-like uh, lines that you have and the patches that you see. Everything resembles the leaf it is sitting on. So to that extent, they have mimicked nature and they have camouflaged. So in such cases, the predator will not be able to easily identify the prey and they will stay safe. All right. Now, another thing is some of these uh, organisms are poisonous. So the predators would have over the course of time learned to avoid them. Third, they will taste very bad. So the predators will not prefer to eat them. One example for that is the monarch 
butterfly, very beautiful looking butterflies. You can find them in India also. It's found in America also. So these butterflies are very pretty to look at, but no predators will feed on it because apparently it tastes very bad. And the reason why it tastes very bad is because when it is young in a caterpillar stage, it feeds on a lot of leaves, right? It feeds on the leaves of a poisonous weed that makes the taste of this butterfly very bad. Okay, so that's about this. Now, yeah, talking about plants, if you, if herbivores are feeding on plants, that means herbivores are the predators and the plants are the prey. At least animals, they can run away and escape. A deer can run away from a tiger and escape, but plants can't even move. So they are very badly affected. Also, about 25% of the insects depend on plants for food. And um, even plants have evolved several morphological and chemical defense against their uh, predators similar to uh, animals. So some of the plants have thorns, acacia, cactus. Cactus actually has spines. This is a mistake. Okay, so thorns are present that will prevent the predators or herbivorous animals from feeding on it. Many plants produce chemicals that will make the herbivores sick. So over time, they will realize not to feed on them. Okay, so there is a plant. I'm sure you've seen this. It is called Calotropis. This plant will produce very poisonous cardiac glycosides that could affect the uh, circulatory system as well as the nervous system of organisms that consume it. Okay, so usually you will not see cattle or goats feeding on it. Yeah. So, in fact, many of the uh, products that we obtain from plants, extract from plants on a commercial scale, such as nicotine, caffeine, quinine, uh, strychnine, opium, all of these are produced by plants in order to avoid being eaten by animals. That's about predation. Now, let's talk about competition. What is competition? I'm sure you know what competition is. Whenever closely related organisms compete for the same resources that are limiting, we say that is competition. Closely related organisms, they are competing for the same resource which is limiting. It's like you all actually. All of you are competing for need probably. It is limiting because 20 lakh above students are writing it but the number of seeds is just a little over 1 lakh. So that is competition, very tough competition. So what are we talking about competition here? Usually when we define competition, we say it has to be closely related species and it has to be competing for a resource that is limiting, but it's not entirely true because sometimes very distantly related organisms also compete for the same resource. For example, you have these flamingos that come visiting to the lakes and you have fishes that are always in the lakes. Both of them are competing for the same food in the pond, which is the zooplankton. So it's not necessary that they have to be closely related. It is also not necessary that the resource has to be limiting, right? So sometimes what happens is in interference competition, if there are two species competing for a resource that is abundant, not limiting, if one of the species is competitively superior, it can inhibit the competitively inferior species. So even then competition will happen, even when food and space are abundant. So how do you define competition then? To define competition, we can say it is a process, it is a type of interaction where fitness of one species, fitness means reproductive fitness, this is not fitness, okay, in terms of uh, how quickly the population density can increase, measured in terms of R, a process in which the fitness of one species, how quickly its population increases, is lowered in the presence of another species. When two organisms are there, Two species are there, two populations. At what rate the population size of this increases? If it is determined by this, if the presence of this will reduce the population size of this species A, then we call it competition. That is the accurate definition of competition. One example for that is the Abingdon tortoise in Galapagos Island. I'm sure you know what Galapagos Islands is. That is where uh, Darwin went to explore and he came up with his theories of origin of life and evolution and all of that. So, yeah. So, in Abing these Abingdon tortoises, they are huge, giant tortoises. They naturally were present in these islands. But some people introduced goats into this island. Both of them fed on leaves and plants basically. Because goats could feed more efficiently, these did not have enough food to eat and this entire species went extinct. Alright, so yeah, within about 10 years, this huge, mighty Galapagos abandoned tortoises 
that species went extinct. Now let's talk about competitive release. Now let's say there is an area, you have one population of one species here and you have another species here. This is competitively superior. Both of them are competing for same resource, let's see. This is competitively superior. Because of its competitive superiority, this A is restricted to the small area. They are competing for the same resource. Now, experimentally, if I remove B from here, what will happen? Because there is no competition for the same resource, A will spread its geographical area. That is what competitive release is. A species whose distribution is restricted to a small geographical area because of the presence of a competitively superior species, it is found to expand its distribution range dramatically when the competing species is experimentally removed. We call this competitive release. It's important for you to understand this. How do we know this? Connell, Joe Connell, he performed experiments in the rocky sea coast of Scotland by making use of barnacles. So, there are two species of barnacles in this, Balanus and Thamelis. Cthamelis, Cthamelis, that's how it's pronounced, but it's very difficult for me to pronounce it. Balanus dominates the intertidal area and excludes the smaller barnacle Cthamelis from that zone. In general, okay, so there are two different uh, species of barnacles here. Balanus is larger, Cthamelis is relatively smaller. So, Balanus dominates the intertidal area and excludes the smaller barnacle Cathamelis from that zone. That is an example. Uh, yeah, so that's about competition. Yeah, there's also one thing called Gauss's competitive exclusion principle. This is very important. Uh, several times in competitive exams, you are asked questions from this concept. What is Gauss's competitive exclusion principle? Whenever two closely related species are present in an area, and they are competing for the same resource, they cannot coexist in that area forever. Eventually, one population which is competitively superior is going to outcompete the other and it is going to exclude that one from that particular area is what Gauss's competitive exclusion principle says. So, two closely related species, they are competing for the same resource they cannot coexist forever. They cannot coexist indefinitely. Eventually, sooner or later, the competitively inferior species will be eliminated. Okay, so if you have an area, you have two species, one species two, both of them are competing for the same resource. This is superior, this is inferior. They cannot live like this forever. Eventually, this is going to take over and this will be completely eliminated. That is what this means. All right. So, actually this was competitive exclusion principle, but this is not entirely true. That is because this will be true only when the resources are limiting. If the resources are unlimit, uh, unlimited, then that will not be the case. Also, in recent studies, we've got to know that whenever two closely related species are facing competition, they are competing with each other for a resource, then in that case, one of them will not be eliminated from that area. Instead, they will come up with ways and evolve mechanisms that will ensure that they coexist instead of one of them becoming excluded. For example, there's something called resource partitioning. In resource partitioning, when two, of, two species are competing for the same resource, they will come up with ways uh, like choosing different times for feeding or coming up with different foraging patterns to make sure that both of them will coexist. For example, you have uh, warblers. Okay, so here you have the example MacArthur. Okay, here you are. MacArthur, he showed that five closely related species of this bird called warbler, they will stay in the same area, same coniferous tree. They will, you know, uh, because one of these species is, um, what do we say, competitively superior, it will not eliminate the other species, but it will come up with ways to coexist in that same area. So, this one will feed, this one will stay in this area, this one will stay in the middle, this one will stay at the tip. So, they have different ways of staying, different food are eaten. Some of them eat insects, some of them eat nuts. 
So what they feed on is also different. At what time they feed is also different. So by changing their feeding times, what they feed, where they stay, they can coexist. All right. So yeah. Now let's talk about parasitism. Many, many parasites have evolved to be host specific. You know what parasite is, right? It depends on a host to get, get its nourishment and also sometimes uh, stays in the host body. Okay. So many parasites have evolved to be host specific. For example, viruses are parasites. You know, they are obligate parasites. What viruses infect humans cannot infect plants. What viruses infect plants, it cannot infect bacteria. So in that way, they are host specific. And along with the evolution of the host, the parasite is also going to evolve. Some of the special adaptations that parasites have are, if there are any unnecessary sense organs, they would have lost them. In order to stick on to the host body, they will have suckers and adhesive organs. They will not have a digestive system. Sometimes there are some parasites present in the gut like your um, flatworms. They get fully digested food. They don't need a digestive organ of their own. So they will not have a, a digestive system. They will have very high reproductive capacity. These are some of the adaptations of parasites. Usually parasites will have very complex life cycles. Many times it will involve more than one intermediate host. Okay. For example, the human liver fluke, it is a trematode, a kind of flat worm. It depends on two intermediate hosts to complete its life cycle, a snail and a fish. And you know about malarial parasite, which is the plasmodium uh, protozoan. This will need mosquitoes to spread to the other host. So that is also a feature. Here you have, see, here you have cattle, here you have human and you have snail here. So this is the primary host. For this liver fluke to complete its life cycle, it will need two intermediate hosts, which is the snail and also cattle. Malaria also. In order to cause malaria in humans, the uh, protozoan plasmodium will require a vector in the form of female Anopheles mosquito. Most of the parasites will cause harm to the host. They will reduce the survival of the host, growth ability of the host and also reproductive ability of the host. Sometimes because of parasite attack, the host will become so weak that the host will become vulnerable to predation as well. Okay. So there are two different types of parasites, ectoparasites and endoparasites. You know what ecto means, right? Ecto means outside, endo means inside. Ectoparasites are those parasites that are present on the surface of organisms. For example, the lice in human head, ticks are insects that are present on in the uh, fur of dogs. They will be attached to the skin of dogs. So ticks, cocopods on marine fish, cascuta on hedge plants, these are present outside the body. Endoparasites live inside the organism. These endoparasites usually will have very complex life cycles and they will be extremely specialized. Their morphological and anatomical features will be greatly simplif simplified and instead they will focus their energy and emphasize on reproducing. Okay, there's a very uh, interesting type of parasitism called brood parasitism. You may have heard about it. How cuckoo birds will lay their eggs in the nest of crows, right? So, uh, the incubation part will be taken care by the crow. Over the course of evolution, they've uh, evolved so much that the eggs that they lay will look similar in size and texture and color to the crow's egg so that the crow can't even differentiate, differentiate which is her own eggs and which is the cuckoo's eggs. Only after the eggs hatch and they will start making those noises and sounds will the crow realize. By then, the work is done, right? So it's like outsourcing the uh, work to crows, right? So the parasitic birds lays eggs in the nest of its host and lets the host incubate them. During the course of evolution, the eggs have evolved to resemble the host eggs in size as well as in color. And as a result, the chances of the host bird in detecting the foreign eggs will be reduced highly. Here I have put some images. You can see how all of these eggs look similar. But this is the egg of the cuckoo and the rest are the eggs of the crow. Here also this is the cuckoo egg. These are the crow eggs. Here this is the cuckoo egg. These are the crow eggs. You really can't make out which is the uh, parasite's egg, which is the host egg. Right? 
yeah so now we've come to commensalism that's about um parasitism in parasitism it is positive negative parasite is uh, benefited host is harmed similarly even in predation predator is benefited prey is harmed and in competition both of them are harmed it's both negative negative interaction commensalism is commensalism is when one species benefits the other one is neither harmed nor benefited it's a positive zero interaction where can we see this you may have seen how orchids grow on top of other trees right for example here you have an orchid growing on the branch of a mango over here the orchid is not clinging onto the mango and deriving nutrition from it like a parasite is just there it's it's an epiphyte it is just growing on top of it but it's not doing it no harm okay so here the orchid is benefited but the mango is neither benefited nor harmed okay so orchid is benefited because it's getting support from the mango to cling on now barnacles growing on the back of a whale you may have seen how there are many barnacles that grow on the back of whales barnacles are arthropods okay so over here the barnacles they are sessile they cannot move but they are helped by the whale because whenever the whale is moving inside water these guys will get a good ride and they will get access to more food so the barnacles are benefited but it doesn't really change anything for the whale it's neither benefited nor harmed so it is zero sea anemone and clownfish you've seen this in finding nemo i think sea anemone is neither harmed nor benefited clownfish gets benefit what is the benefit that clownfish gets sea anemones are um, they will have uh, stings right they can sting other animals when they come close to it if these clownfish are staying around these sea anemones are among them there will be no predators that will come close to eat this so that is how the clownfish will get protected cattle and egrets this i'm sure everybody would have seen cattle will neither gain any benefit nor harm from this association but egrets will definitely be benefited these little birds will always be seen around cattle why they are there is because they feed on insects whenever these cattle are moving on the grass insects that are lying inside the ground will come outside so they they can feed on it they will get more better access to food that is why they are around these cows so these are some examples of commensalism finally we have the last interaction mutualism where both the organisms will be benefited example for that is lichens in lichens you have algae and fungi living together in a close mutualistic association what happens here is fungi will help in better absorption on, of water and minerals and give it to the alga which requires it for photosynthesis and algae prepares food it gives it to the uh, fungus for i mean it it provides the same food for the fungus that way both of them are helping each other out and we have mycorrhiza mycorrhizal associations is when uh there is association with fungal hyphae and roots of higher plants like angiosperms and gymnosperms what happens here is the fungus again helps in providing water uh, and uh, minerals specifically phosphorus to the roots of plants they will enhance the absorption in return the plant will provide the fungus with food okay so that is mycorrhiza uh plant animal mutualism is also very very interesting to study plants need the help of animals for two things one is for the uh, pollination to happen angiosperms pollination has to happen many times it happens with the help of insects and other animals and also for the dispersal of seeds after the seeds have formed if they have to be dispersed naturally if nobody sowing them if in forest it has to be dispersed naturally then what happens the animal will come feed on it either it will drop it down while feeding or it will go down and come out as animal droppings and then grow into a new plant so for its continuation of generation two very important processes are pollination and seed dispersal in both of those processes many plants take the help of animals all right so as a result for helping the uh, plant out the plant will give something re in return for the plants in the for in, in in return for the animals in um, in terms of um, rewards like uh, nectar see pollen grains fruits all of these will be provided by the plant for the animals as rewards for performing pollination and pollination and uh, seed dispersal there is one specific example that's given in your ncrt it is a fig wasp relationship you know fig plants right 
Fig plants have a beautiful hypanthodium inflorescence that is kind of cup-like and covered. Flowers are present inside the cup. These flowers, for every fig species, there is another wasp species. Only that species can perform pollination in that particular flower. Okay, so these wasps, what they will do is, this is the inflorescence, it will go down here. Why it goes down there is to lay eggs. So these female wasps, they will go down here. In the process of going down and coming back out, it will pollinate these plants. So these guys will lay eggs in the inflorescence. Once the eggs hatch and the larva forms, the larva will start feeding on the seeds that are present inside this and come out. So, fig inflorescence is helping in the reproduction of moth, I'm sorry, wasp. For wasp reproduction, egg laying is a very important part. It is giving the safe place for the wasp to lay eggs, right? So, how is fig being helped in return? For fig reproduction, pollination is a very important process. If pollination does not happen, seed setting will not happen. If seed setting does not happen, next generation will not come. So, in the process of going inside to lay its legs, it's going to lay its eggs, it's going to pollinate the flowers. So, in that way, both of them are very, very, uh, you know, what do we say, mutually helping each other out. Now, in such cases, what happens is, if for some reason, uh, one of these species will go extinct, the other one also will, be, will go extinct because they are dependent on each other for the purpose of reproduction. Without this fig, this moth will have no place to lay eggs. Without this moth, this fig will not have any pollinators to uh, pollinate its flowers and ensure seed set. So, in that way, both of them are dependent on each other. So, with this, we have come to the end of today's session. No, not yet. We have another example. Uh, sometimes what happens is, plants cheat. Plants cheat. Example for that is an orchid. It's a Mediterranean orchid called Ophrys. This one will employ sexual deceit. What happens is, one of the petals in the flowers of this particular uh, orchid will resemble the female species of a bee. So, the male species will get confused and think that petal is the female species. Here you can see, right? This petal is the, resembles the female bee. So, the male bee will assume this is the female bee and try to copulate and as a result, it is going to, um, what do we say, pollinate this particular flower. But this is not actually reproducing because this is not an actual bee. So, this is called pseudo copulation, false copulation is happening. This plant is basically super clever and it's cheating and this is being, uh, you know, uh, what do we say? This is performing sexual deceit. All right. So, that is about mutualism and with this we've come to end of today's lecture. I hope it was engaging and helpful. I'll meet you again in another, in another session soon. Until then, take care of yourselves, take care of your health, stay happy and keep smiling.